As an old Starship launch pad gets demolished ahead of future upgrades, a new Starship launch pad is nearing completion ahead of the first Starship version 3 flight early next year. To prepare for that, this week SpaceX stacked the last major part remaining for the first version 3 booster, and began major stacking and construction of the first version 3 ship. SpaceX is also paving the way for what's well beyond the next flight with further progress at the Starbase and Florida Gigabays, and hardware for multiple Starship launch pads for the Space Coast. What's up, Star Pals? I'm Jack Beyer for NSF, and this is your Starbase Update. The nature of making a weekly video like Starbase Update means that there are times when something happens during editing that makes certain parts of the episode outdated. Pad 1 demolition is one of those things. But the benefit of letting a whole week pass is that there's a large number of developments to now talk about, so let's start here at Pad 1. Some of the first work relating to Pad 1 demolition after Flight 11 started right at the beginning of the week, with teams starting to take pieces off of the chopsticks. This included the sleds at the end of the chopsticks, which are, uh, sorry, were used to help keep ships and boosters centered on the landing rail during lift operations. These were also the ones that were used right after a booster catch, since the booster obviously can't land right in the center length of the rail, so they needed to get the booster centered following a catch. SpaceX also removed the ship lift pins, which were used on version 1 and version 2 ships for stacking. These were two pins, one per arm, that would go into sockets located on the body of the ship and would allow the arms to lift the ships for stacking. These will no longer be needed because going forward, ships will be lifted by the catch pins rather than having separate lifting sockets. Besides that sort of hardware activity, teams also removed the very long cable that raises and lowers the chopstick carriage. We think that SpaceX may want to upgrade the traveling block on the Pad 1 chopsticks from the current 5-loop block to the 6-loop block that they installed on Pad 2. That is, the wire now loops up and down the tower 6 times rather than 5. That gives them a greater mechanical advantage. The other option, albeit a bit more unlikely at this point, is that they'll want to remove the entire chopstick and carriage system from the tower and work on it separately. For the moment, nothing seems to indicate that, but hey, you never know. Now, I'm sure that if you're not watching Starbase Live 24-7, or you just casually follow the Starship program, you may wonder why in the world would SpaceX even go through all of this work in the first place? And yes, this is also addressing some of your comments to last week's episode. We're trying to make this a more regular thing, so keep leaving your comments and we'll try to tackle those in future episodes. Well, over a year ago, SpaceX began building Pad 2 at Starbase, and very quickly, it was clear that it had many design changes to it. A lot of these changes were all about building a launch pad that was better and improved, but other changes were clearly to accommodate the new version 3 ships and boosters. So, for example, the Pad 2 chopsticks have improvements, such as being shorter, so they move and stop faster than the Pad 1 chopsticks or the improved stabilizer arms that swing out further and therefore will avoid hitting a ship aft flap during ship catches. But then there are other accommodations as well, like the landing rails being designed to fit the new catch pin design from both the ship and the booster. The geometry and size of these pins has changed for the new version, likely due to lessons learned catching boosters over the last year. This meant, for example, the lip of the landing rail had to be modified for the Pad 2 chopsticks and made the Pad 1 chopsticks incompatible with Starship version 3. With Flight 11 now behind us, SpaceX is now in the process of refitting Pad 1 with Pad 2's upgrades and modifications, but to upgrade also means to get rid of the old stuff, and that includes a lot of the chopstick hardware that is no longer needed. Hence, this work we're now seeing. We don't know if these exact same chopsticks will be the ones used or if new ones will be built, but so far it looks like the former will be the case. This whole cycle of destroying in order to create has been a constant theme across Starbase. We've seen buildings built and torn down within a couple of years, and a lot of modifications to the area's landscape and skyline that just didn't stick around. I mean, remember the Gateway to Mars sign that lasted, like, a month? Another big part of this Pad 1 upgrade process is the dismantling of the launch mount. In the last several days, SpaceX has marked the areas of the launch mount that will be cut up and taken apart with green paint. It's pretty funny because, as you may know, I'm a fan of bagels, and Pad 1's launch mount kind of looks like one, so now with all this cutting, they're really going to give it the bagel treatment. Kind of weird that they toasted it first, but hey, I'll take it. Man, now I want a bagel. Given the green marks, it does appear like SpaceX wants to start slicing pieces off of the top first, and will likely proceed to gutting the innards of this thing from all the wiring and piping and everything else. Side note, don't scoop your bagels. If you're scooping your bagel, the bagel's wrong. A lot of the external pipes have also been marked in green as well, so crews know where to cut them up. The same is happening now as well on the tank farm side of things. While the ground storage tanks are common between pads 1 and 2, each pad has its own set of pumps and subcoolers and other auxiliary hardware. 
This effectively makes each pad have independent tank farm supply, which is neat because you don't have to run all the hardware for both pads, just one set of hardware for whatever pad you're using. But now, all of the old Pad 1 subcoolers and pumps are outdated, so those are being taken apart and removed as part of this whole refurbishment process. SpaceX is also removing the berm that protected the eastern portion of the tank farm from Raptor exhaust during Pad 1 static fires and launches. You may remember a couple of months ago that we had a document from the Army Corps of Engineers showing a map with a proposal by SpaceX for the future of the Starbase launch site. This already showed that the tank farm berm would go away and would be replaced by a blast wall like the one being built for Pad 2's deluge tank farm. In the future, the area where this berm is located will turn into an access road coming from the newly built roundabout at Highway 4. The future plans for Starbase's launch site also includes an expansion to the south to accommodate for the future Pad 1 flame trench and also an extended deluge tank farm. So this means at some point we may see the current deluge tank farm going away and being replaced by a much more capable one like Pad 2's system. While all of that teardown and demolition work is going on at Pad 1, Pad 2 continues to get outfitted ahead of its first launch early next year. Part of this outfitting consists of cladding the service structure next to the launch mount so it's protected from launches and landings. In recent weeks, SpaceX has been closing out this cladding going from just a few panels a month ago to most of the structure now fully protected. Except for the two entrances at the base of the service structure, the entirety of the southern face is now completely covered. The top of it has also been cladded as well and is now flush with the launch mount deck. The west and east sides also received pretty much all of their cladding and the only work remaining is installing the panels that will go over the gap between the flame trench wall and the service structure itself. If you look closely at this cladding, you might notice that there are vents in certain locations of the service structure. Some of these are for ventilation since it's an enclosed space and people have to go inside and work on it in between launches. But other vents are part of the structure's own purging system. It seems like the interior will be purged with nitrogen during launch operations to keep an inert atmosphere inside and prevent fires. All of this has to be vented out, so there are vents for that as well. Another bit of progress has been the removal of even more scaffolding from the western and eastern sides of the launch mount. This is great news because the less scaffolding up there installed on the mount means the less work remains to complete it. Once it's fully cleared, then SpaceX will probably be able to start testing the top deck water deluge, for example. Besides, I don't think it's a great idea to launch Starship with scaffolding still there. Just a thought. Now that being said, we did see what appeared to be a tiny bit of water coming down from the inside of the launch mount into the flame trench last week. We're not sure whether that was something related to the mount's own detonation suppression system or something else. The amount of water was so small that it may have just as well been an employee emptying a water bottle. Okay, maybe not, but you get the point. In the meantime, on Tower 2, teams have begun installing the wiring that'll go up the tower to the ship quick disconnect arm. This has been placed on the new cable tray that we've talked about in recent episodes, and since it doesn't seem like it'll continue further up the tower, it kind of confirms that it is indeed for the arm. By the way, the LR-11000 crane at the pad seems to have been mostly reconfigured by now with the SpaceX parts. It's also got a jib installed now, which could allow it to help install the arm on Tower 2, but we'll see better once it's fully up and running again. Among all the crane action we've seen from SpaceX, there's one thing in particular that we've been eagerly awaiting. The activation of the LR-13000 crane at the Starship launch pad within Launch Complex 39A in Florida. In the past few days, teams have finished putting together the crane and have raised it for the first time. This massive crane is the one that will help lift and install the Starship launch mount at Launch Complex 39A. This week, our Florida team flew over the Space Coast, which means we got to see this crane right before it went up. We'll also have a fully dedicated video coming up soon about everything we saw during this flyover, but we can still take a quick peek at that, and you'll get the full report from Max and the team once the full video comes out. As I said, that monster crane is now waiting for the launch mount, and that mount is still at Roberts Road as of this recording. However, it may not be there for long. Apart from the fact that it looks a whole lot more complete now than last month's flyover, We've also seen SpaceX preparing the path that the launch mount will take out of Roberts Road for its trip to 39A. SpaceX has also staged the three SPMTs that will be used for the roll, so stay tuned to Space Coast Live because any day now that launch mount may roll down the causeway to get installed on the pad. In recent days on Space Coast Live, we've also seen several deliveries of tank farm hardware for 39A, such as subcoolers and tanks, which once again Julia spotted outside the center. During our flyover, our team also spotted more progress on the launch tower for Space Launch Complex 37, and it seems like they're now building the top three sections of it. Last but not least is also the massive progress at the Florida Gigabay construction area. Some portions have already two floors above ground, although there's about a third of the Gigabay that still needs to get its floor poured. 
Also, as we mentioned last week, it doesn't seem like SpaceX is in a rush to get the other two tower cranes up and running just yet, so it'll be interesting to see if they're just prioritizing one half of the bay first before doing the other. Of course, that's not the only gigabay that SpaceX is building. Here in Starbase, teams continue to make a load of progress on the one we've got going up at the production site. While the Gigabay here is running about a month behind compared to the Florida Gigabay, it seems like the Starbase one might have a good chance at catching up soon. While last week we said that SpaceX was installing two of the four tower cranes expected to help in its construction, now parts have arrived and started to be put together for the other two tower cranes. So while the Florida Gigabay seems like it'll just be running with two for the time being, Starbase's Gigabay will have four cranes at work. Now, Help me out here with the math, because I think that four is bigger than two. Or in other words, with more cranes, it's more likely that construction will go faster here in Starbase and eventually catch up and maybe even surpass Florida. Additionally, of the first two tower cranes that we talked about last week, one of them is now fully assembled and running while the other one is almost complete. Although it may actually be up and running by the time this episode goes live. And if all that was not enough, the small LR1300 crane that showed up a few weeks ago has now also been helping put together the first columns for the Gigabay before those two tower cranes were fully operational. And so the race continues. Do you think it'll be Florida finishing first or Starbase first? Let us know in the comments. I'm definitely interested to see what you all think. Now, it may very well be a year or two until we start seeing vehicles come out of the Gigabays, but much closer in time, we've got the two Megabays here in Starbase. While there are no complete vehicles inside them just yet, we may well be just weeks or even days away from Megabay 1 having a fully stacked booster inside of it once again. This week, SpaceX rolled the last barrel section of Booster 18 from the Star Factory into Megabay 1. This section is the third out of three that make up the forward stack of the booster. In case you don't remember, Remember, SpaceX builds boosters in two halves, the forward stack and the aft stack. The aft stack goes from the common dome down to the engine section, so it's essentially the liquid oxygen tank. The forward stack goes from the forward dome section down to the bottom of the methane tank. Once both halves have been completed, then SpaceX joins them and welds them together to complete the structure of the booster. With the final barrel section now in Megabay 1, we assume that it's likely been welded to the rest of the forward stack by now. That means that only one weld remains to complete Booster 18, the one that will join the two halves of the vehicle together. Once Booster 18 is complete, it'll likely go to one of the work cells inside Mega Bay 1 and get fully outfitted prior to its cryogenic proof test campaign over at the Massey Outpost. This outfitting process often involves installing wiring, pressure lines, raceways, and also the composite overwrap pressure vessels, or COPVs, used to store several of the commodities needed during flight. So yes, we're but one weld away from a fully stacked Booster 18, but a whole lot more work will still remain before it's ready to begin its pre-launch testing. But wait! Booster 18 is not the only version 3 vehicle to get some stacking action this week. Last week, Ship 39's nose cone and payload bay assembly had been moved from the Star Factory and into Mega Bay 2. So, of course, right as we were editing last week's episode, SpaceX rolled out the next barrel section and started stacking it on the turntable. Unlike boosters, SpaceX stacks ships from top to bottom instead of doing it in halves. Since a few ships ago, SpaceX has been welding together first the ship's nose cone and payload bay inside the Star Factory, and has then rolled out that assembly into Mega Bay 2 to continue stacking. While version 3 ships include several upgrades relative to version 2 ships, they'll remain the same size, so it wouldn't be surprising to see that version 3 ships have the same number of barrel sections and in the same size each. For version 2 ships, the barrels were from top to bottom, the payload bay section, the forward dome section, which is the top of the methane tank, the common dome section, which is both the bottom of the methane tank and the top of the oxygen tank, then another two barrel sections for the middle of the liquid oxygen tank, and finally the aft dome and engine section. So far, both payload bay section and forward dome sections are the same size on version 3 ships as we saw on version 2. That would be three and four ring sections respectively. By the way, it's really interesting how compared to the early ships and boosters, SpaceX optimized the stacking process by connecting the two barrel sections with ropes to aid in lifting the new barrel into the welding turntable. If they didn't do this, they would have to first remove the existing stack from the welding turntable, put it aside, then attach the crane to the new barrel and put it on the turntable, disconnect the crane, and then connect it again to the older barrel so it can go on top. You get it, it's complicated, but th with this little silly workaround and some ropes, get it done, they get it done. This method is so much simpler and it saves them a lot of time and work during stacking. Besides, it's pretty cool to see in action. Now, I said before, the sizes and number of rings of the payload bay and forward dome sections are the same as what we saw for version 2. But of course, the bigger differences are in the hardware installed on them. I guess this is the moment to address the elephant in the room, because we mentioned last week, oh hey, Ship 39's nose cone rolled to Mega Bay 2. 
but we never really explained all the cool new additions and differences from version 2, and there are a lot. For example, one of the big differences for version 3 ships is that they now have docking hardware to dock with other ships in orbit. These are placed right below the payload bay door, and for now, it's just a simple housing, but we expect it to get fully geared with hardware to enable those dockings in orbit in the future. Very much like what we reported last year, and what we've seen in SpaceX's renders, the docking system will be a simple probe and drogue design like we've seen used on Soyuz or Apollo. As we mentioned earlier in the episode, another big change from version 2 is that version 3 ships will no longer have dedicated lifting sockets. That means every lift done after the nose cone gets welded to the payload bay is all done using the catch pins. We have already seen SpaceX using the catch pins of some of the later version 2 ships for stacking, but they still had the option of using the lifting sockets if they wanted to. Now it's just pins all the way down. And don't forget, the catch pins have also changed in design as well. They're now a lot sleeker and have a smoother tiling over them. They're also further up the ship, now located right at the bottom of the nose cone assembly rather than at the top of the payload bay section. This means the catch pins may be out of the view from the camera located on the forward flap during catches, so I really hope SpaceX has taken that into account and put a wider lens in that camera or adjusted its placement so we can still see it. I really want to see a shot from the flap cam seeing that pin setting down on the chopsticks just like we saw from Booster 12's catch on Flight 5. Apart from those changes, it also seems like SpaceX has implemented the tapered heat shield edge on the thermal protection system for the nose cone, which makes it look really good. Two of the four Starlink antennas have also been moved from below the payload bay door back to the nose cone like we had on some of the earlier ships. There are also new attitude control thrusters on the forward dome section and payload bay section. Some of them even face upwards, which could be related to having to maneuver the ship for docking with other ships in the future. You know, we could probably go on and on, but then this episode would be a whole lot longer. We should probably make an entire separate video about a lot of these changes, especially once we see fully completed ships and boosters and they've gone out for pre-launch testing. Inside the Star Factory, future ships are also being prepared for construction as well, and teams are going through them at a rapid pace. For example, Ship 40 has continued to receive its heat shield tiles, but it also now sports its forward aerodynamic flaps as well. Once it's fully outfitted, we may see SpaceX stacking it on its payload bay section, which should be somewhere inside the recesses of the factory among the many other barrel sections there. Ship 41's nose cone has now finally been covered in scaffolding, and it has started to receive its thermal protection system in the form of the Pyron backup ablative felt. Caesar also spotted Ship 45's nose cone on the methane header tank installation stand, so that now means that it's got two header tanks installed. It's pretty funny because some nose cones in the hall haven't been installed on some of their work stands or are just not complete enough yet, so all we can see are their tips poking out from above the windows. Strangely, we have not seen Ship 44's nose cone yet. A while ago, it disappeared into the Star Factory, and we haven't seen it again, so it's kind of a mystery what might have happened to it. Now let's move over to McGregor for our McGregor Minute, and take a look at all of the Raptor action this week. Since our last look at McGregor, SpaceX has conducted 17 Raptor tests at that site. Of these, one at the beginning of the week broke the record for the longest burn time at the newly opened Raptor North test stand at 80 seconds, up from 60 seconds a few weeks ago. What's really cool is the fact that this record didn't even last long, as a few days later, SpaceX fired a Raptor on that same stand for 101 seconds. So it seems like they're upping the amount of time Raptors are being fired at that new stand. This may soon increase even more, given the new water tower that SpaceX is building near this stand. Based on the location, it's not that hard to guess that it might be used on the Raptor North and South stands, which could allow the water deluge system to run for even longer with that increased capacity. We've also seen SpaceX continue to do 114 second long burns at the Raptor vertical stand. This is quite a specific burn time that doesn't seem to correspond with any specific time during the flight, so we really have no idea what's up with these tests. Maybe they're not even related to imitating test flight durations at all, and it's just some kind of standardized or acceptance testing that they use to compare engines. This week, we've once again spotted some of these Raptor engines coming and going from the test stands, like engine serial number 21 or serial number 30. And finally, it seems like our old friend, RVAC serial number 8, was removed from the Raptor South Stand and brought out to the Raptor Barn at McGregor. We'll see if they roll it out again to the test stands, or if next time we see an RVAC 3 engine, it's a new one instead of that one, which we've seen a lot by this point. You know, for the next few weeks, it may seem like things have slowed down just because there won't be Starship launches for a while. But SpaceX is working nonstop on many fronts, and not even just here at Starbase. 
as we've seen. Hopefully we see vehicles headed out to the Massey Outpost for testing in a few weeks as SpaceX progresses towards Starship Flight 12 and the first flight of Starship version 3. Once we have version 3 vehicles out in the open for testing, it will become that much more real that we're entering Starship's next chapter. All right, that's going to be it for this week. Thanks for watching, and I hope to see you on the next one. But as always, don't forget, be excellent to each other.